Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm joined again by Gary Wayne, author of the book Genesis 6 Conspiracy for part two of our conversation. In part one, Gary spoke in detail about his research in the life of Jesus from his birth to resurrection. So if you haven't seen part one yet, you can check it out here. I will also link it below in the description bar. Today, we're going to talk about the legend of King Arthur, Guinevere, Camelot, 12 Knights of the Round Table, the Isle of Avalon, Excalibur, and Lady of the Lake. And then we're also going to talk about the fairies. Who are they? What happened to them? Are they still with us? So grab a cup of coffee or tea, sit back and relax as we go down this rabbit hole with Gary Wayne. So welcome back, Gary. I'm so excited to have you back for part two of our conversation. How are you? Doing very, very well and uh, looking forward to the conversation today. Oh, fantastic. And I just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas if, because it's that time of the year. So a very Merry Christmas and a happy 2022. Well, thank you. And uh, Happy New Year and a, and a Merry Christmas to you as well. Oh, thank you so much. All right. So today I want to focus on King, the legend of King Arthur. Um, I've always been fascinated by his story, like many other people. You know, it's a story of heroism, uh, honor, and, you know, so much magic and mystery is connected with it as well, and the whole romanticism of it. So I've always been fascinated about, you know, what that re what really happened in the time of King Arthur. So I want to cover everything from, you know, Guinevere, uh, Excalibur, the sword and Lady of the Lake who gave it to him, Isle of Avalon, you know, the final resting place of King Arthur, or it's believed, and there are many, many versions of that as well, because there's a version that says the, he didn't actually die, and he's still alive somewhere in the yeah, in yeah. mystical place called Avalon that nobody knows where it is, and then also about 12 knights of the round table, Camelot, and also there's a connection with the fairies as well, so I want to build that in. And then perhaps yeah. if time allows, we can talk about the fairies separately as well, uh, not exactly in context of King Arthur, but just a little bit more specifically to them. So, but um, before you uh, dive in, can I ask you to uh, build the narrative in a way that so that uh, anyone who's listening, um, who uh, it doesn't know that much about uh, the legend of King Arthur, but have, have, they have a curiosity about it. And so if you could build it in a way that, you know, uh, from a, a starting from a mainstream perspective of what is believed to be the legend of King Arthur, and, uh, you know, especially things like what time in history it took place. And then from then on, if you could jump into your very extensive research, as I understand in this subject. So I'm very excited for this. Yeah, so it's uh, one of those sort of, I guess, archetypical stories that is set sort of in between really ancient history and, and modern history. And King Arthur is based on a real individual and an individual that actually lived and was a king, uh, maybe not quite in the same manner that is written in um, the Grail stories, but certainly was a real individual and an important person in his position and who he represented to people who follow uh, that kind of history and that kind of belief system. So he's a, uh, he, he is almost like a superhero of his age, I guess would be the best way to put it for people uh, of this time period and when I say a superhero I mean that's like that's exactly what superheroes are based on would be his archetypical character that goes back into prehistory would be an allegory of those kinds of hero individuals as well and so when we look at King Arthur it has a significant amount of detail and complexity to the story and it's written in several different novels and by several different writers so you get not a, a direct historical accounting but sort of a revisionist um, almost like a docudrama uh, where there's some artistic um, 
liberties that would be taken, but liberties that would be more in a way that would be fitting in terms of if you're part of the bloodlines, if you're part of the mystical religions, it would make a lot of sense to you. So the writings tend to come up in the Middle Ages when we start to get these writings that we know of the King Arthur legends today. And they're sponsored by essentially the Knights Templar. And so one of the things that if somebody's paying attention to some of the detail, particularly in the movies and particularly in the writings and some of the allegories to the different knights, is that you have Knights Templar that are showing up before they've been created as a knight order because the, the, the knights are created in 1090 um, by descendants of the bloodlines that are characterized in. Uh, the King Arthur tales. And so as the Knights Templar become more wealthy, they start to be a patron of the arts and they're going to write part of that history. So all of the famous writers are basically funded by the Knights Templar. And they're a rosy cross order that goes back into the history and back into the Knights of Builder Guilds, the time of Solomon. And they're the Knights of the, the Rose and the Cross, and they actually become reassembled in the time of Constantine and, and the start of Rome. And that's important to understand in terms of how they sort of overlay that back, because the Knights Templar weren't there, but there was Knights that were there and of that bloodline. But the Knights of the Rose, of the Rosy Cross, were kind of a papal uh, knight order that basically remained in Rome. So you got all of this sort of interplaying into the story and then they're telling a history. They're telling their, about their belief system. They're telling about their genealogies that are all encoded into the storyline and into the characters. And that's very, very typical of this style of writing where it's written as if it was a fairy tale. And fairy tale is a very important allegory and understanding is when we start to get into some of the characters and as you were referencing with some of the fairies and the Lady of the Lake, but there's a lot more fairy imagery that is overlaid in there. And it has encoded and embedded into it allegories. And so in what they would call the art of the green language, and understand there's a green knight that would have a similar sort of kind of relationship in terms of that understanding of green and legomanism is or legomanism. You have a fairy tale, which is another word for the same thing, where you have a very, very interesting narrative, but you have real meaning that is understood by the adepts of the Gnostics and of the secret orders and understand when we're talking about the bloodlines is the Masonic royal orders are the bloodline orders. And so mm -hmm. orders like Freemasonry as we would understand it today would be lower levels of those Masonic royal bloodline orders. And so they would understand it in all that sort of way. And this was a crossroads in terms of history, which is also important to understand, I think, that it is the end of the Celtic kingship at the time of uh, the Roman invasion, as it spans the history of the genealogies that are written into King Arthur. And then you have sort of the demise of the Roman Empire in about four to 500 AD, where King Arthur is going to be somewhere, depending on which historian you're referring to, somewhere between four to 600 AD, probably in around 500 or so. And there's a transition in terms of the Camelot dynasties and the King Arthur dynasties into the aftermath of the Roman influence gone and then the invasion of the Saxons, which is going to again topple the, the King Arthur dynasty. So you've got all of that sort of kind of working around the edges of, of the story. So I thought I'd lay that down and then I'll let you jump in and see where you wanna go with it from there. Yeah, just a quick question about that, actually, because um, 
when you just do uh, a research um, from the mainstream perspective, what you hear is that the, the first person to have known to have written anything about King Arthur's story was somebody called Jeffrey. I've forgotten his surname. I should have written it down. But, Jeffrey um, but of he, Monmouth. Yes, thank you. I knew you would know the name. Um, <laughs> and he wrote it um, uh, in the 12th century. But then uh, no, we're not really sure whether he was writing from the recent past or, or writing of the recent past, or was he writing about King Arthur who had uh, lived in the 500 AD, 700 AD, like you were saying? Because there's sort of different, yeah, takes on that. There's different, there's different views on that, but he is creating sort of the basis for the later writers to build on. So the simple answer is yes, he's creating the atmosphere and the environment for the other Grail stories to be written. But he writes so much more. He's writing sort of a Kind of almost a revisionist history of England and Wales and the bloodlines of the giants so that he's going to take most of those genealogies back to giants shortly after the flood and present that genealogy all the way through. So do you um, or from your research do you uh, think that uh, Jeffrey, who is you know known for putting these writings down first, was part of the Freemason order or Rosie uh, Rosie Cruz Cruzen. Sorry, I don't know how. I still haven't learned how to pronounce Rosicrucians. <laughs> Rosicrucians. Thank you, Rosicrucians. Uh, so, was he commissioned by them? From what you believe, certainly, certainly not as the Rosicrucian order as we would understand it today, because. The Rosicrucian order doesn't really sort of surface visibly till about the 1300s, right? Okay. But in 1188, I think is when you really mark the transition of the Rosy Cross order into the Rosicrucians. And that was at the cutting of the elms at Beezer Castle when the inner high level bloodline split away from the Knights Templar mm -hmm. and formed their. Uh, a new organization that was that was separate that spawned what became the Rosicrucians. So it's still the same chain of orders. Um, so what Jeffrey is writing about is, and understand that at that time, it's the feudal system, right? So the only people that are educated are the noble elite. And so whether or not they're a first cousin of the king or a 15th cousin, the whole nobility and educated class and priest class mm. are all of the nobility bloodlines. So even if they are just a patron that's being sponsored as in the arts, let's say in Medici out of Italy would be probably the most famous and sponsoring Botticelli and Leonardo da Vinci and many others, that was very, very common and they would hire them to preserve their history, but not in a way that would be super obvious to uh, people that maybe read the stories, that maybe couldn't read at the time, but they, they, they wouldn't want to be identified in a way that people would say, well, are they human? Because of who they take their genealogies back, which is why they wrote in that style as a talked about with that green language or Langmanism or the fairy tale concept. And you know how we have um, uh, the idea of when books are published and uh, uh, writings are, you know, authored, um, that it's either a fiction classified as fiction or nonfiction. So I, I imagine that when people like Jeffrey were being asked to write these, you know, or document history for these secret societies, um, that were they being exposed to the common person? And if they were, then were they being uh, classified as fiction? Or, or did they really believe that this is what happened? Because the reason I'm asking is because if yeah. you lived in, if you lived in that time, you, through word of mouth, uh, you would know whether that story was real or not, or had some basis in reality or not. Yeah. So the poorer people would receive these stories through the oral tradition, right? Just as the Robin Hood stories were known and understood, but were part of the written tradition, but just passed on to the poor in an oral tradition, mm. but. Who they're trying to, I should have identified who one of the groups that they're trying to protect themselves because there's a power struggle that's always going on between 
the papacy and Roman Catholicism and Gnosticism right throughout the Middle Ages with the Albigensian you know, Crusades and things like that, um, and with the Cathars, that they have to write in that sort of style, right? So, but this would be considered history, but because you have the fairy tale concept that's written into it, you have to know what parts are just this part of the superficial story and what are the parts that are reflecting the true history. Well, that's a perfect segue into your research, because obviously for us people living in in this time, uh, you know, for us, it's a legend buried in the midst of time. And we, it's hard for us to unpack what's based in reality and what uh, isn't. So, what does you, so with all the research that you've done? So, my understanding is that you've done over thirty years of research in all these um, uh, types of legends, and you know, obviously, mm -hmm. biblical prophecies and all of that as well. So, I'm very curious to know if you can uh, what you know to be truth versus fiction in the legend of King Arthur. So, I mean, we do know he was an, he was an individual it's, and, and we do know he was an actual king and we do know that he reigned uh, throughout Wales and was quite, quite a warrior. So we know that part is true, but when you get into the details of the, of the life and that's when it starts to get a little bit more precarious. But who Arthur was is he descends down from the Tuatha de Danann. Mm. That's his that's his bloodline. And his father is a pen dragon, a chief dragon. And so you've got an allegory already written in there that he is part of the bloodline, the patriarchal bloodline of genealogies that go back into the mists of time. Mm -hmm. And and his and and his wife, Guinevere, is also a um, a real person and is the actual name of his his wife as I, as I understand it and that she was a fairy queen and again of Tuatha Do Danann bloodlines so the Tuatha Do Danann were fairy people mm. they were the fair ones and they were the giants of Ireland and so just in the encapsulation of the two characters you have two very, very important individuals that are represented in, in a way that is designed to be like a new Atlantis, just mm -hmm. as uh, Excalibur is thought to be part of the Atlantan, Atlantean mythology. And just as everything that is about to come about is he's creating this new era, this new uh, ideal golden age is what he's representing um, in, 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 in kind of a short part of the history because, you know, it doesn't last that long. But that's, that's, that's sort of the concept that he is a direct descendant out of the golden age. And, you know, allegorically, he would be looked at as a sun god. And Guinevere would be as a mother goddess. So when you're looking at a fairy queen and fairy godmother, as you get in the fairy tales, you see how those allegories start to cross over and they're talking about the same type of individuals. And the matriarchal bloodlines are the fairy bloodlines. So both are represented in there. So, you know, just there you're starting to look at, boy, what else is going on here? And Camelot. In, in terms of the place that they reign from um, is not a happenstance sort of name. It is rooted in history and, you know, it comes from Camus Lot and Camus would be a curved light and Lot would be Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah because in the Gnostic tradition, Sodom and Gomorrah were cities of light. They were cities on a hill, just as Camelot is talked about as that shining city on a hill. And then in political uh, talk and jargon today, particularly let's say with the American audience, Washington is looked upon fondly as the shining city on a hill, as that sort of allegory, right? So it's a city of knowledge, it's a city of, uh, thought. It's a city that is expanding um, science and the arts, and it's looked upon in that sort of sort of manner, not 
to the not in the way that Lot would be connected to Sodom and Gomorrah from a Christian perspective. And so they looked at Sodom and Gomorrah as cities of light and knowledge, and that the evil God of the Bible destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And that was the home in Gnosticism before the flood as Gomorrah is being the start of the giants. And afterwards, uh, Sodom was the, the start of the uh, giants after the flood. And so they're very, very important cities that, that are wedded in. So when you look at other names that are going to sort of come up, look for that name Lot, because it's going to have a significance to a place of Lot that is in France, which is in the home of the Cathars. And Lot is also going to be home in Norway, uh, where the Viking wrecks do come from, where the Viking uh, St. Clairs and St. Clairs come from of, uh, of Freemasonry. And you have Gawain, who is going to be uh, the Green Knight that we talked about, and his father is the King of Lot, Norway. And then you also have, you know, Lancelot, uh, which has encoded into it a land a lot. And Alan are the people of the Scythians, and they are the progenitors of the Tuatha Dé Danann. They are the they are the fair haired, as the Tuatha Dé Danann are fair skinned. They have red hair and hazel eyes, and there's also the blonde hair and blue eyed ones that are also part of that race. And those were the skin colors and descriptions of the Atlanteans. And the Scythians are thought to have escaped from Atlantis, uh, not from Atlantis, from Tartarus after Atlantis falls, after the rebellion, after the flood, they escaped. And they're also known as the, not only the, the Tuatha Dodanan, they're also known as Tuatha Danu, or the tribe of, of Anu. So you get the crossovers on all the different types of mystical religions coming out of prehistory and so all of this is is uh woven into it because the Alain are another branch of the scythians that migrate up through france and in, in with the uh mixing in with the merovingians and also migrating to england who are going to intermix in the bloodlines of the early um, camelot dynasty starting in about zero a.d zero to 180. So I know I covered a lot of ground there, but I thought I would connect yeah, a little no, bit more right. of the of the uh, historical allegories that are that are written in there. Yeah, no, that's really good. Um, and that leads me perfectly to one of my burning questions. But before I do that, I just want to clarify. So when you say that they, um, the stories were written to uh, depict uh, descendants from uh, the golden age of Atlantis. So are we, um, are we saying that in that time around 500 AD, um, there were descendants and King Arthur and Guinevere were living during that time or did it actually happen much, much earlier than that? It's just the stories were written at that time and they had to somehow come up with some sort of a timeline that was not real. Yeah, I think it's 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 telling an ancient history. So it's 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 like a story for the time, but it's based on something that's already happened as well. So it didn't happen necessarily in 500 AD as yeah. it's written, but it could have happened m many many eons ago because a lot of people believe that Atlantis goes back, you know, at least uh, 11,500 years before the Ice Age. Um, so if that's true, then any descendants from Atlantis would have uh, happened much uh, further back in the past than 500 AD. Yeah, it, it depends on, yeah, it would have been much further. I mean, no matter how you look at it from a secular or a, a religious perspective, it's before the flood. Now, some people will say there was more than one flood, but it's before the flood that traditionally people would sort of reference in their mind. Um, and, you know, it's the same flood that would have destroyed Atlantis that are talked about with the flood in the Bible. And it's this actually, you know, it's the same story. You know, you have Poseidon who is going to take a, a wife um, called uh, Climbing and produce 12 or 10, I'm sorry, uh, Nephilim or Titan or hero kings. 
and Ireland and England were part of that 10 nation empire of Atlantis. So you have a direct connection of the land that reflects back to Atlantis as well. And the Tuatha Dé Danann take their genealogy back to them from before the flood as well. And when you, when you look at um, Merlin, uh, Merlin's not a name, it's a title. It's for a wizard, uh, it's for a priest. And he is in the image as you get him in King in the Grail Tales with the long white beard and the tall pointy hat of the sorcerers, whether or not it's in Lord of the Rings, which is telling of, a, of that antediluvian period, or right out of Atlantis, which is the classic description of the wizards uh, that were practicing mysticism in the empire of Atlantis. So you, there's way too much imagery in there not to think that it's not transposing a more ancient tale on to more modern characters at the same time advancing the genealogies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and protecting those genealogies. And just as we talked about that, that's what that style of writing does. So the intention behind the legend of King Arthur being uh, penned by Geoffrey was that they're basically documenting their own history although it happened uh, much further back in the past than they have, uh, you know, decided to write. Um, but it's basically, they, so they know, they know that it, there are, which parts of that story are the, based in truth. Before sure. your average person, you know, we, we just, we've been taught to treat them as uh, literally as fiction. But, you know, I don't know who, who was, uh, who's the person who said this, but I really believe that myths are our memories. And um, yeah, so... Then it leads me to my burning question, which is that, okay, so the legend of King Arthur is basically depicting the descendants from the golden age of Atlantis. So we can say that. And uh, so when we're talking about these descendants and we are talking about Nephilim, who are the giants, and we're also talking about the fairy queen, there's fairy uh, bloodline there. And then you have King Arthur, who's uh, you know, father's name is it? Who is it? Uh, is Uther, Uther Pendragon. Pendragon? Yeah. Yep. And so you have that word uh, Pendragon. So we, so here we are talking about fairies and dragons. So my burning question for you, Gary, is that when we talk about bloodlines and when we talk about that, you know, Guinevere was a fairy queen. Uh, are we actually talking about? Uh, humans living side by side with fairy people with the wings and whatnot um, or is it that there was a time in our history when uh, you know a maybe we had as humans we had better abilities to perceive uh, beings from other dimensions and maybe basically there were beings that were in slightly different frequency yeah. to us and we had those abilities that we could interact and interface just like we do with each other humans uh, today or is it that uh, those stories are really about middle earth and middle earth is either in another dimension or is physically in our physical middle earth <laughs> and we're on the surface so you know there's so many possibilities there so it's hard for me to articulate my burning question, but I think you you hopefully understand the question buried in there. Sure. That's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to work back uh, from what you finished with to what you mentioned in the beginning. So Middle Earth is in polytheist uh, legend, which would be their history, uh, comes out of their religions, uh, would be the ground that was separated when chaos was removed from the earth. So just as the waters above from below were separated to create the firmament and to create the earth in the Bible, they're talking about the same idea and that's where Middle Earth comes from. And that's from the Northern Tuatha Dé Danann mythology of the Norse, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's important to understand the reference points. They all talk about whatever religion and historical uh, mythology or legend that you're getting from around the world, they're all talking about the same events from a different lens. One could be a monotheist lens, one could be a polytheist lens, and then you've got the, uh, the seculars who are talking about those events from a secular lens and interpreting them from a secular lens. So it's just a, sort of a matter of what, how you're viewing that. 
And so when we move backwards and you're talking in terms of what you're talking about, and you have in prehistory, you have humans walking amongst dragons and fairies. We need to understand what that means yes. because there are different kinds of dragons and there are different kinds of fairies. So let's start with the fairies uh, and then I'll work into the dragons and, and you'll see the consistency and one being a matriarchal uh, allegory as well, another one and the, and the dragon being the patriarchal. So when we talk about fairies, everybody thinks of the little people, right? And the different kinds of little peoples and there are more than one category of fairies that would be the elementals and there's in the elementals you've got four categories and they're the lowest order and they are created by um, the the gods or the upper fairies and so you've got the uh, the good looking fairies um, you've got uh, the ugly ones like the gnomes and the hobbits and the dwarves and the trolls. And you've got uh, the mischievous ones like the leprechauns and the trickster um, little ones. And then the fourth one is the, and they're, they're larger than the little people. Um, they're called the salamanders and they represent the four elements uh, in, in, in polytheism. So, um, and above that, you've got three other categories. So I'm going to now jump to the top one. And in fairy, uh, in the fairy culture, they would be referring to the ones who came from other planets, and they were led by the proud fairy. And so they're talking about angels, right? Mm -hmm. And they came to the earth uh, as fairies, as are understood in the fairy culture. And, also understand that fairy is thought to be the root word for pharaoh. And it's the ultimate advancement in ancient knowledge that in that culture they think is coming in the new Atlantis when the age of fairy is gonna be recognized and promoted and honored as a high level knowledge and, and uh, religion. And so these, these, these fairies, rebellious fairies come to uh, the earth, and then they create um, earthborn fairies. And that's the Tuatha de Danan, as it's understood in the fair folk or the fairy people before the flood. And then there you have another mix in there of the bodiless spirits of the Tuatha de Danan. And those are like the banshees. And um, I'm trying to think of the other... Uh, um, spirit that's the, in the fairy lore it, 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 it escapes me but that is that is the uh the bodiless spirits so are like demons right so you're, you're getting sort of the bigger picture as to what these beings are in the um in the fairy culture now you cross over to so they would have been interacting with the the gods which are represented as the fairies uh before the flood and they would have been interacting with the offspring of the gods with human females as in Atlantis that we talked about who are the demigods right they were and a demigod is defined in polytheism as the offspring of a god and a human being and so it had an immortal spirit that was put into the body um, that didn't die and wow. so the body died but the spirit doesn't die and unlike humans it doesn't sleep because and it's immortal and it roams now from the dragon understanding is, is those are seraphim angels. These are serpent-faced gods. These are serpent-faced six-winged angels. These are the rebellious seraphim that we would understand from a Christian perspective who ran as the earth as the watchers before the flood. And they're the ones that made up the pantheon of the gods. And so they created in all mythologies around the world, all of these giants that are all around the world. It doesn't matter whether or not we're talking about the Miocene in China, or we're talking about the Daitria, or the Azura in India, or we're talking about the Zababa, or the Kamazots, or the Kishimaya, or the heroes, and also called Titans. Uh, they're interchangeable with the Earthborn ones in Greek mythology, or the Anunnaki in, Sumerian mythology, or the Nephilim, or the Raphaim in, in 
Israelite history. They're talking about the same individuals, just different names. And so these are the individuals that ruled on the earth with humankind and created offspring and kings and queens that ruled the earth, right? So mm -hmm. that's the imagery that is being specified in the matriarchal and the, and the patriarchal bloodlines of fairy and, and the dragon. So we need to understand though that there are also different kinds of dragons. So, and a dragon is understood in antiquity as either a serpent or a crocodile type creature or a flying dragon. And so the seraphim or gods like the Nagas or gods like Osiris and Isis or gods like Enlil and Anki or gods like Quasicotl are all these flying serpent gods, right? And that's why you have all this imagery around the world for serpent or dragon gods that are essentially identical and kings and queens that were also called serpents because they were the original offspring and looked like them in, in the early times uh, with serpentine type features. Uh, and so you have uh, this, this common sort of legacy that sort of passed down. And so in the fairy mythology, when you see the noble Celt, which would be the white uh, elf, uh, that's particularly prevalent in the Lord of the Rings and the North version. They're not the little people. They're actually sort of an allegory for the Tuatha Dé Danann as the giant. So when you see a painting that's called, let's say, the Riders of the Shea, S-I-D-H-E, which is also can mean portal Shea, right? But these are the Riders of the Shea. They have this Tuatha Dé Danann look, and they're also you know, riding horses with horns, with unicorn uh, imagery on them. And you need to understand that they are representing these individuals by, uh, in a similar fashion in the writings as to what types of beings the gods also created. So they created more than just the demigods. They also created the little people, right? They created all sorts of beings in prehistory whether or not it's the centaurs or whether or not it is things like Pegasus, whether or not it's uh, beings like um, Chimera or King Havada out of the Epic of Gilgamesh. They have all of these strange beings that are created throughout and it's all created by these gods because they did a lot of interaction on the earth when they took a physical presence on the earth and ruled until they were not permitted to rule. Mm, interesting. So going back to what you first said about all of this, is that the fairy beings originally came from another planet. So uh, they were. So did, did they come from? Do you think they came from actual physical planet or they're interdimensional beings just living in a different frequency and they started to interface with our frequency of the third dimensional Earth? Yeah, as you dig deeper into the fairy mythology, you get into the portals and you get into the shades. So if you have fairy mounds, those are uh, fairy portals. You have fairy domains, which are sort of mini Stonehenge type of um, stone arrangements that are all over the earth. And, and domain means portal. Um, and you have uh, a, an understanding of another place that the gods and the demigods would cross over between. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they would go into, you know, most people would understand the most common dimension. So I'm saying dimension as opposed to throughout the universe, um, that they were coming through different dimensions. And the other world, the nether world or the underworld, um, would be one of those dimensions, right? So in polytheism, you get all of these gods who are kings over the underworld. And that's thought to be in the earth in sort of the superficial understanding, but it's not. It may be located in the earth, but in another dimension. And to get back and forth, you have to be able to cross over between portals. And so even the bodiless spirits tend to go and live in the other world. And so when they're talking about um, Avalon in King Arthur, that's that 
analogy for the other world. Now, it may be a different dimension than the underworld. We don't know how many different dimensions that there are, but it would be a different dimension for sure. That's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. And I was going to talk about that a little bit later, but let's talk about it now. So Avalon um, uh, is a, a mystical place that nobody really knows geographically where it's located, but a lot of people, there's a belief that it is Glastonbury today in England. And, um, and it, there's been a lot of speculation and little archeological discoveries here and there to suggest that Tor is, um, uh, which is a little hill. And on top of that, there is, um, uh, and um, Archangel Michael's tower. And if you, they say that uh, it could be that that's where the final resting place for Arthur was when he was, after the bloody final battle, he was uh, taken to Ava, the Isle of Avalon. So there's all these stories about where Avalon could be, but um, I actually visited Glastonbury a few years ago and the locals definitely believe that the tour is where Avalon would be and that it's just happens to be in a uh, in the same location but a uh, different frequency so it's yes. uh, in another dimension which kind of ties up with what you just said yeah and it makes sense when you look at polytheist religions and again it doesn't matter whether or not it's the fairy um, religion or it's the Druidic Celtic religion or, or the Egyptian religion you have particularly of importance for the kings and the queens, but one presumes that that goes right through the royal bloodlines of the nobility, that they are preparing in the knowledge to guide their way through the underworld, right? Mm -hmm. And they're learning this knowledge and they're preparing to, to cross safely into this place. So that is presupposing that their spirit isn't going to go to sleep right so they are going to be wandering and they need to know how to get to where they want to go they don't want to go to the abyss and they don't want to be wandering spirits like the demons are that are recorded in, in the bible that are thirsting uh, for a place of rest and that's why they possess people right so they're trying to get to where they want to go and in the ugaritic texts you have the rapi you um, and these are the offspring of the Bali, and they would go between the underworld, um, even when they didn't die through the portals, uh, as, as did the gods. But certainly, when they had a funeral, they were doing the procession as it's recorded in in the ritual that they're recorded in the Ugaritic text, to that, so that that spirit would go safely into the underworld and not to a place of horrors. So do you think that's what um, the uh, legend really means uh, with King Arthur? Because the legend is that um, when King Arthur was fatally wounded, he was taken in a boat um, across the, river, um, uh, the, the body of water to the Isle of Avalon. And, yes. um, and, that's, uh, so, and there's different variations of what happened to him after that. Some people believe, well, there's a legend that says that he's still alive. And he, he was completely healed in Avalon. And, and there's also a legend that says that he didn't quite die. His spirit turned into a raven. And then there's another one, uh, is, which is that he's still, he's actually sleeping. He's alive, but he's sleeping somewhere in a cave. I know it sounds really far out. Um, in a golden cave. And if you were to come upon <laughs> that cave, uh, you would see him sleeping. Yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> and, and, it, and it's interesting because the imagery of going on a boat is the same imagery that's in the Egyptian religion um, of these boats that they would travel after death uh, to make their way through the underworld, right? Yeah. So I think it's the same idea that's going on there. It's also interesting you talked about the raven uh, as it's connected to King Arthur, which is a lesser understood and lesser used allegory for the patriarchal bloodline as well. So typically um, it, the most common is dragon and then not so common as raven, but that's why raven is so um, widely used throughout the occult religions and then fairy and owl. So just as owl sort of connects back to Lilith and everything like that, it's part of that matriarchal bloodline as, as, as well. So I think there is that connection there that they were talking about the same sort of place. And again, that is a similar type of understanding that comes out of the Scythians. 
in terms of traveling into the underworld using a bow. And as I talked about before, the Alan are also a Scythians and Alan has a, a, a really, really kind of important role as being the nephew of Joseph of Arimathea, who has connections more back that are also connected into um, other bloodlines I won't go down right now, but I'll understand Alan is a very, very important name that's wedded, embedded into the Camelot King Arthur story. So you get names of uh, uh, the Alain in there, of uh, Alain de, de la Grosse, you have Alain or Elaine, you have uh, Elions and you have Elaine. Um, so you've got several different people that are reflecting that name and lit a transliteration of Alain. And that again is not sort of uncommon in terms of how the names are used. So even like the Bron giant is sort of the short form for Hebron right out of the Bible um, that has three giants, you know, Tesh, uh, Anakim giants, which are um, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, and was known as Kiriath Arbor, the city of uh, Sefer, not of Sefer, of Arba at the time. And Arba was the father of the Anakim giants. So they got all of this stuff that's just constantly allegorized into the characters and things. I know I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there, but it's, it's important to understand that all of that is, is, is important just as the, you know, the whole understanding of the grail is, is important in terms of what they're searching for in terms of that holy grail. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you back in because I think I, I took you in a direction that maybe you weren't going, so. You know, I'm very curious about holy grail, but that I feel like there's a whole entire episode in just that alone. It's, so much <laughs> it's to a big unpack. topic, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll travel down that rabbit hole, uh, hopefully another day. But um, so just to um, summarize with um, what you were saying about so, uh, the fairies and the dragons and all the beings that seem to have come from other dimensions and there seems to be a time in our history in the golden age of Atlantis when there was all this cross breeding happening with the gods and demigods and all these different beings existed uh, side by side with us so if that's if that's accurate and how I've summarized it then um, does that mean that the time that we're living in right now is a little bit more unique because we only tend to see humans uh, like we all look the same we we don't have any extra powers or magic going on unfortunately uh, so was that a time when uh, that was actually happening that they live side by side and they could travel between portals to other dimensions come back and have all these uh, interesting experiences that obviously are not part of our reality right now. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it's uh, recorded all around the world, um, mm. just different um, stories telling the same type of interaction and the same type of things that they did. Yeah. So what it doesn't matter whether it's Greek mythology or it's fairy mythology, if they're talking about the same pantheon of gods that were uh, ruling over the earth and the same type of demigods that they created to be the ruling class over the earth in this age of exploding knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and that's again, exactly what the Bible and the book of Enoch talks about. I mean, it's, it's all from whichever lens that you're, you want to look at it from. So I think that that actually happened and it disappeared. I think it happened twice and disappeared. I think it happened before the flood. Mm. And I think when uh, you have the offspring gods pop up, which is really important to kind of understand history, you have to understand there's a flood, as I, I talked about earlier. And the offspring gods in polytheism, they overthrow the parent gods. So when I'm talking about the parent gods, if people aren't familiar with it, uh, you would be referring to the Ogdo gods, let's say of Egypt. Um, that would have Ra and Seth and oh, not Seth, he's an offspring god, uh, Anubis, gods like that. And then the offspring gods are like Isis and Osiris and Seth, the ones that show up after the flood. And in the Greek mythology, you have the parent gods like Gaia and Kronos, and you have offspring gods like Zeus and Poseidon. And they represent and they, they kind of take over the positions of 
the parent god. So Poseidon would take over from Iapetus, Zeus would take over from Kronos. Uh, and you have Enlil and Anki in the Sumerian pantheon who are going to take over from you know gods like Anu and Tiamat, for example, as, as the parent gods. And in the uh, land of Canaan and the land of the covenant, you had El as a parent god, and uh, his, his son is Baal. Baal are part of the offspring gods who are going to rule in Mount Hermon afterwards, and Baal and the Baalim are the gods who produce the, the Rapiu in the Ugaritic text. And so then they disappear, right? There's a period where you've got gods interacting both before and after the flood. After the flood, not for a very long period of time, but a very long period of time before the flood. And so I don't think that the offspring gods, from a Christian perspective, I don't think the offspring gods overthrew the parent gods and killed them because you can't kill an immortal. Make it's doesn't make any logical sense. If you're immortal, you mm. cannot be killed. I think they were imprisoned and they went to the abyss, which is also in the underworld, but it's the prison in the abyss, or as it's known in Greek mythology as Tartarus. And of course, the place that the demigods are trying to avoid that we're referencing in terms of the rituals and the sailing into Avalon or into, into the underworld, they're trying to safely navigate through the underworld and not into uh, the, the prison. And then if the angels who created the demigods um, before the flood went into the prison for those illegal crimes, as they're talked about in the Book of Enoch, then the Balim and all of the offspring gods did the same thing. So like Zeus is the father of Hercules, who's a post-Diluvian giant, then they disappear not because anybody overthrew them, is, is that those ones who committed those crimes also went to the abyss. Mm. But everybody wants to bring that age back in the polytheist belief system of where these angels were working and, uh, and walking amongst humankind, which is that dream that the Rosicrucian and second most powerful individual in England wrote about. Uh, in his book, The New Atlantis, and that's Fra Francis Bacon. And so what he's writing about is that future new age, that future golden age, that new Atlantis that they want to recreate. So it sounds like all these beings, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but including the fairy beings that are, you know, uh, often depicted as, uh, you know, the, the luminescent ones, and they have special powers, but they seem quite peaceful. For the most part, that they, we're talking about lower realms, not higher realms, because right. obviously there's a there is only a the there's only a single god, you know. So we're talking about gods in a different context here, I guess. They're not gods in the sense of the true one god. So it's, it all sounds like that this all of this history is uh, uh, basically about beings and what happened to them, what they did during that, their lifetimes it, to do with lower realms um, yes. rather than higher. So is there, is there any higher realm uh, beings uh, existing back then as well? Because it, to me, uh, from you know, the legends, it sounds like uh, Queen Guinevere of the fairy realm sounded like she's from the higher realm. Like, you know, there's, there's an interplay between light and dark. So, so King Arthur sounds like to me, uh, you know, he's from the uh, part dragon lineage that then maybe that's more to do with the underworld. And then she's from slightly higher realm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure when I, I would look at the duality that's being expressed in quite that sort of manner. Mm -hmm. Duality in their... Uh, literature tends to express more within their belief system that there is forces of good and forces of evil. So they would believe that the God of the Bible is just another powerful angel, uh, no more powerful than their gods, and that they're in perpetual conflict and dualism. And that's the overarching sort of dualism that is always in play, the yin and the yang, so to speak. As it plays out within the belief system, you have good and evil within 
that belief system. So you would have had good heroes in Greek mythology and you would have had um, evil heroes. So Hercules would have been considered fighting for good and also helping humankind and fighting, fighting against the, uh, the terrible giants. Um, you have white magic and you have black magic. You have um, this sort of concept that you have flowing this all the way through. You have good witches and you have evil witches, you know, black witches and white witches. This is just, it's a common sort of force that's being played out with this knowledge within their belief system that's sort of at war uh, for dominance and uh, who is going to who's going to rule from that perspective but it doesn't sort of overlap as easily as people would think into the overarching dualism that's the ultimate fight against good and evil you've got that war in between and then you've got them fighting against the overall forces of evil so it's a matter of who's going to dominate that realm and what's interesting to understand about all of that is is that in all the different sort of bloodlines and in all the different realms are always fighting for control with each other, which is why in ancient, they never got along. Even though they could have got along, got along and shared the role, they, they just didn't get along. And in polytheism, actually they, the gods got quite concerned with how evil the demigods became, right? Because of not only warring with themselves, but what they were doing to humankind overall and so they bring the flood for those reasons uh so it's it's so i'm not sure it's a fight over the physical realm and the underworld realm um i actually think that they're trying to dominate both hmm. and everything is about trying to as you learn the knowledge and mysticism about becoming a physical god in the physical world as opposed to uh, an immortal in the heavenly realm, which they don't seem to have access to anymore. Yeah, and that, that's just from their perspective, but putting their perspective aside, I would imagine that if, um, if this is what happened to us in uh, our history, or prehistory, then, um, you know, the, the, our landscape looked a lot different, you know, with the type of beings that uh, existed or walked the earth back then. And just like now or any other time in history, you know, there's always uh, the good and the bad and, and uh, we are all work in progress. So there would have been, you know, heroes and, uh, and villains and all, but ultimately all making their way or um, through well, the path ultimately. of it. Ultimately, anything that seems to take a physical form in this world is corrupted by the world. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. Um, and that's another rabbit hole as to you know why we're yeah. here and what the purpose is. But uh, so coming back to, uh, um, I want to explore uh, a little bit more about the fairies in Tuatha de Danann. So you were saying that um, the interdimensional fairy beings that came to Earth, they um, crossbred with the humans to then produce the Tuatha de Danann, who are the fair-skinned ones either having uh, red hair with green eyes or uh, fair-skinned uh, fair blue, uh, blonde and blue eyes. So, so, so with um, Guinevere, she, if she was pa uh, part of that lineage, are we actually talking about a proper fairy queen with wings and all? <laughs> not with wings, no, not with wings. Oh, that's just hoping for wings. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but obviously that's what they would like to ascend to be as, as they reincarnate and, and that, in that sort of whole belief system, they're, they're, they're trying, trying to get there. But no, they, they don't have wings. Yeah, but, but there's no reason. So, but, okay, so let's talk about um, the fairies themselves. So yeah, um, yeah. you've talked about how um, uh, there are different categories of the fairy beings. Yep. So the two I'm really interested in um, are, are the ones that, you know, we learn about in our fairy tale books um, of childhood, like the Tinkerbell type, you know, the little ones that um, uh, emit a fairy dust and they can fly and uh, perform all kind of magical, you know, uh, things and they're childlike um, in how they are, but they're also very human in their emotions. And then you have yeah. these beings, uh, the tall, taller ones, the human size or slightly taller ones, like yeah. the... The White elves, elves from yeah, yeah. the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So, um, what do you, from your research, like, are these beings actually exist? Did they actually exist in exactly those forms? 
and, and I think I, I think they did. They may be some for the fairy tale genre may have shrunk a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but we get all sorts of uh, little people throughout all of the polytheist religions around the world of these beings created, and in it's a legacy that's on all continents all around the world, and they have the same groups. So we have this constant. Um, and so the good looking ones probably weren't quite as small as some of the ones that are depicted in fairy tales, but they were typically smaller. Uh, as all of the three forms of the elementals were except for the white elves who were taller. Um, they were actually more representative of the earth, the earthly Tuatha Dodanan. And they're also kind of almost depicted like that in Lord of the Rings, only they're not depicted as giants, but they've got that fair skin, they've got the red hair, or they got the blonde hair, they got the blue eyes, and they're typically depicted that way. Each of, and, and there's so many different ones and that you can talk about, whether or not it's the brownies or, or pixies and on and on and on, they were all created for a specific purpose. They had a specific role to play. So the dwarves, for example, they were, they lived in the earth or in mountains. And again, just as they're depicted in Lord of the Rings. And they were commissioned to create the weapons for the demigods and the gods. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. So that's why you see them forging weapons in, in Lord of the Rings. The gnomes were in charge of the knowledge in keeping track of the genealogies. And so they would have been working with uh, the priest class. And what's interesting about the gnomes is that, and trolls would have looked after guarding some of the, the gateways, just as ladies of the lake were also uh, part of the fairy culture of protecting portals. Uh, so the ladies of the lake were fairies protecting a, a portal into the underworld and, a, and a water is a common way of going from one dimension to another dimension in, in the fairy culture. So the gnomes, which are very, very interesting, they are depicted as being with us all throughout history. And they are ones who come through um, fairy mounds in flying machines. And they're known for kidnapping people for a fortnight, particularly in, in Scottish and in Irish and uh, Celtic uh, lore. And they would do sexual experimentations on them. And their descriptions, uh, if you didn't know it was a gray alien, mm. if, you, if you didn't know th this was, 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 I'm sorry, I mixed that up. If you didn't know this was a fairy, you would, understand it as a gray alien kidnapping encounter. So they had these spaceships, that, interdimensional ships that would come through and kidnap people. And they look exactly like the gray aliens. And so I think these beings have been around because I think you know for a while, either they were able to escape before the flood into the underworld and the portals, or they were recreated again after the flood by the offspring gods. And so you go through each of those categories and they do specific things and they do specific things in each of the cultures all around the world. So they're part of the organizational structure, but limited to what they were permitted to do. That's so interesting. Yes, I think there's a real crossover between what we hear about the gray aliens and what they can do and also lots of yeah, different. Yeah, there's so much there to explore and um again, another rabbit hole in itself. Um, so I'll, I'm really fascinated with what you just said about the, um, the Lady of the Lake. So uh, in King Arthur's legend, Lady of the Lake emerged from the lake and gave Arthur the, the Excalibur sword. Yeah. Is that correct? Or am I mis uh, misremembering that? But she gave it to him, didn't she? After he pulled it from the stone, he loses it, right? Okay. Oh, yes, yes, that's and right. Then, yep. And then it gets returned to him by the yes. ladies of the lake yeah so the lady which is the really lake. interesting in, in when you think about that what you know what does that mean right mm. so so it literally is uh like uh, yeah i totally agree i think water is um 
uh, a way to, or anything that is reflective, I feel is a way to cross dimensions or travel between dimensions, just like mirrors and things like that. And that's why, you know, when uh, you see pe- uh, someone doing scrying or looking at a crystal ball, I think it's all to do with reflect anything that's reflective. Um, so it's interesting that Lady of the Lake uh, can comes from another dimension from what you were saying through the body of water to give uh, Arthur that sword. So um, yeah, that's that's and the, the sword itself is so magical. So do you, so t- let's talk about yeah. Uh, so who do you think um, was the Lady of the Lake? He said that uh, you mentioned that she was from the fairy realm. So was she helping him because of the Guinevere connection, or yes. yeah, because of yep. because of her? So yes. he's getting helped. Yeah. So so it's uh, it's altogether possible then, isn't it, that uh, Guinevere in uh, in real life would have looked something like the elves from Lord of the Rings. You know, they have kind of this sort of etherealness about them, a luminescent, and they're quite peaceful, but they're still not perfect beings. You know, they have their issues and agendas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds something like that, doesn't it? It is. And you have, again, all of the forces on one side and the dualism helping each other and all the other forces working against it. So again, you've got, you know, the arch nemesis characters that are in um, uh, the Grail Tales as well. So, and what's interesting about the sword being returned is it's coming from another dimension. Mm. That's where it's been hidden, not necessarily in the water, because, it, but it, it's going to be in another dimension. And what's also interesting is that this was some sort of super weapon as it would have been understood in yes. ancient history, right? That it had the ability to kill gods. Like it had the ability to, um, and probably demigods in that sort of sense, but it had the ability to do things for the individual that it was made for. So anybody who went to try and pull that sword out of the rock, they couldn't do it. They could touch it, but they couldn't do it. So it was able to recognize the DNA of the individual that was touching it would only perform properly for the, that individual that it was made for. That was the high degree of technology that went into the sword. Technology that we're only understanding today of how that might work. And yet they knew about that at that time when they wrote it. And they knew about all of these other dimensions when they wrote the Grail Tales. They knew about things that the average people are just starting to learn about today. And that knowledge has been kept by these societies and and religions from the time of prehistory. That is so interesting. That definitely sounds like some high technology based on you know, uh, King Arthur's frequency or DNA that allowed him to pull it out of the yeah. rock that it was embedded in. So yeah. yeah, that's and that's why we can't find it now. There are no, um, uh, uh, there's no way for us to locate that uh, sword anymore. I mean, it was the legend says that one of his uh, knights uh, who survived the battle threw the sword into the uh, lake after Arthur had, you know, been supposedly killed or fatally wounded. Yeah. And so you would think the, that still is in the lake, but you, I don't think it would be if it was interdimensional. It would be interdimensional. And the sort of ancient history of this kind of sword goes back through the Scythians and the Sarmatians, which again are interconnected with the Tuatha. To Danan from Scythia, from the Tartarus region where they would have escaped from Tartarus um, in Scythia after the flood, according to the polytheist religions. And it was it was Excalibur, uh, was what the Scythians, as I recall, called that sword. And it was that super weapon of the giants that they that certain individuals who were you know, probably giants like, you know, you know, Atlas, they were the great giants who were had that sword as wielding it for the wars that they had had to fight and for their own protection. And if you go into um, whether it's Greek mythology or, or Indian mythology and, and religion and history, the gods had powerful weapons, mm. like just magnificent, powerful weapons. 
And you get that all throughout Norse mythology as well, whether it's the super axe or, I mean, and you can see it in all of the superhero movies today that they're displaying those some of those weapons. And again, that's the actual weapons that these giants had before the flood. They had a level of technology that we're just catching up to today in, in so much that we, we couldn't build Machu Picchu today. We couldn't build the pyramids today. That's just a few examples of the technology that they had. But when they talk about in their history and their religions about all of these other advanced weaponry, we don't have that level of technology today. We are just starting to peer into that area and understanding. Yeah, absolutely. There is so much buried in the past for us that we have no idea about. Uh, I feel like there was a time, uh, all, um, this would have happened many times in history possibly, but it, life seemed to be much more um, varied and, and, and exciting and dramatic uh, by the sounds of you know what we experience today. You know, today it's pretty routine and mundane. So, um, and uh, you're absolutely right. Every, you can, you have all you have to do is look at all the different cultures uh, around the world that are, yep. uh, you know, have they have all everybody has some story about fairy like people or you know uh, yep. like advanced weapons or, or flying ships. You know, it's it's yep. all there. So one of the things that you had talked about earlier that maybe we should touch on um, before we close out is there's a couple of characters that I find kind of interesting, particularly with the names. One would be, you know, Morgan Le Fay. Yes, uh, Morgan the Fairy. Yeah. Yes. And, yes, yes, please. Let's talk about her. <laughs> and and so she's a very she's the mother of Lancelot, right? She's you know, one of the members of the Knights of the Round Table, and we're kind of sort of heading into this and um you know and you know there's also that character that is i think it was the it was elaine who was the was the lady of the lake and you know lancelot is lancelot of dulac of a house of family bloodlines that that he's sort of relating to and it's morgan Le Fay that's the, the mother of lancelot so when we look at each of these 12 knights that are around the round table, these aren't just knights. These are princes. These are sons of kings. These are representing families from all the way from Norway to throughout the British Isles. This mm -hmm. is the Lord of the Rings uh, allegory that they had this alliance of these bloodline kings that were working together um, first to uh, overthrow the Romans uh, and to get them out, um, and then later to get thrown back from the Saxons. So that if you look sort of down the road in 1066, when William the Conqueror is taking the throne of England, mm -hmm. he is uh, a descendant of Rollo, who expropriates Normandy uh, in nine. 12 AD, if I've got the date right, I'm within a year or so of that. And they changed their name to what they signed the Treaty of as the Treaty of St. Clair. And St. Clair is, you know, is uh, going to be a battle partner of Hugh de Payon and Godfrey de Bouillon and the Folk of Anjou in the Crusades less than 30 years later as they're going to retake Jerusalem and they're going to form the Knights Templar, right? Who are going to sponsor the writings of, of, of the, uh, of the rail tales. And they have their bloodlines that go back to the Merovingians. And of course the bloodline of the Merovingians intersects with the Camelot dynasties through Aragon, who is uh, one of the, you know, 10 sort of kingdoms or 12 kingdoms that are represented around the, the Knights of the Round Table and marries uh, Minabad of the Merovingian bloodline. That's how that bloodline crosses in and then descends down to the founders of, of the Knights Templar. So you have these, these kings that are the Knights of the Round Table that is representing something that happened in past. And these kings in past in the Lord of the Rings, let's say in Nippur in Sumeria, but they have a, the same version 
all around the world, they are awarded their divine right to rule by the gods that they produce them and that they worship. And so this is representing, again, what happened with the 10 kings of Atlantis, I think in part of its imagery and that it's thought of as that new Atlantis of that time. And that would make um, King Arthur like Atlas of the Atlantean Empire. Interesting. And um, yeah, because I had um, written down here, they wanted to ask you about Tolkien, because there's obviously a parallel between King Arthur's legend and uh, Tolkien's, you know, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit uh, trilogy. Given with what you're saying, sounds like um, these books are not just written by a Jeffrey or a Tolkien, they are commissioned by uh, secret societies to basically yeah. document. So is, is that what happened with Tolkien as well? Because um, yeah. when I was in Glastonbury, um, sorry, not in Glastonbury, when I was in England, I also visited Avebury, which has these um, henges, like the Stonehenge, but they're smaller ones and they cover a vast, yeah. a vast area. And in that place, there's a, a tree called the fairy tree. And it's an old ancient tree. And it's got this amazing network of root uh, at, uh, as it's propped up on a little bit of a hilly spot. And um, the locals there believe that Tolkien actually sat under that fairy tree and he was given that story to him by the fairy people. I mean, that's a really interesting story to entertain. Um, that yeah. I couldn't find that story anywhere on the internet, but that's what the, that's what I was told when I was um, visiting there. So I want to know what you so, think about all of that. Well, you, if you're going to be communicating with these spirit beings, you're going to have to be a very high level adept of mysticism, like mm -hmm. a Rosicrucian, for example, uh, who are commonly thought to talk to these um, other beings from other dimensions, whether or not you follow them aliens or spirit guides or demons, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they talk to them and they get a lot of information from them. And Tolkien, he uh, goes to school at Oxford, which is unusual for somebody uh, supposedly isn't of royal bloodlines. And he joins the Inkling Society, which is a writing society that Lewis and a whole bunch of other famous writers of, of uh, chivalry and heraldry and fairy tales and dragons and occultism are all a member of over the years. And the Inkling Society is a Rosicrucian society. It is sponsored by the Golden Dawn Society, which is infamous in its own right. And these are, this is an MO of what happens in, in the entertainment industry is either the information is provided either through spirit beings or it's passed on through the Rosicrucians or other people to let's say places like Hollywood to write these stories, they get that information delivered to them. But in, in the higher levels, they are crafting their writing style to produce these type of works. And Lewis was part of that inkling society and best friends with Tolkien and so you don't get to be part of a Rosicrucian society if you're not of royal bloodline mm -hmm. and people say well Tolkien his family isn't of royal bloodline well only if you don't look for it it's not and if you follow his, the migration of his family and the Tolkien name it actually goes back to Norway and to uh, the royal families and it comes down through a varieties, but most commonly it would have come down during the invasion of Normandy with the Rollo bloodline that produced the St. Clairs and St. Clairs who went to Scotland and the Tokes that went to, um, to, to England and he's part of that bloodline. So he would have been initiated from childhood as an adept. He would have been an adept before he was an adult. So he didn't have to go through Freemasonry to be invited into a Rosicrucian, which is a higher level organization. He was already an adept of whatever degree when he got there. So he was there to learn and craft his writing skill and to uh, connect to the sources of where he was going to write this history for um, their culture, right, for, for their religion. And that would 
preclude as being high level adept that he would have been talking to the spirit realm and getting this information to be able to write. So they're writing their history and their belief system and their genealogies through these writing guilds. And this is not an unusual MO of what they do because hey, consider that they've ruled the educated class almost on a monopoly basis until recent times. And Francis Bacon, who we talked about, he had two writing societies. He had the uh, Knights of the Helmet Society, and he had the Spear Shaker Society, which everybody believes that the name Shakespeare comes from. And he used those societies to develop um, the English language and to create this type of writing. So Shakespeare, whether it's Bacon or it's Shakespeare himself or however that all comes about, he is writing the same kind of literature as what Tolkien or Lewis is writing. He's writing the same type of literature that let's say Homer or uh, any of the ones who wrote the classics in, in Greek mythology, whether it's, you know, uh, even in Roman mythology with the uh, Ovides and Metamorphos and all of those types of writings. It's the same style of writing that's come down through history that's going to encode their history and their religion in those stories. That's so interesting. It makes perfect sense. So then um, with the parallels between the legend of King Arthur and uh, Lord of the Rings, as you were saying that the 12 knights of Camelot were actually the, the kings of Lord of the Rings. So is legend, um, is Tolkien trying to retell the story of King Arthur uh, with greater accuracy through Lord of the Rings? Or is just another story and embedded in that is also King Arthur amongst so many other things? Yeah, I think King Arthur ha has a lot of imagery that comes out of what Tolkien has written. And a lot of that history. Mm. Um, you don't see all of those different type of characters and things at play. Yes, uh, you because get... I couldn't place who King Arthur would be in Lord of the Rings, but I can sort of see that Merlin would be Gandalf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, you're looking for, if you're trying to get a comparative, you're looking for the king that's going to, you know, eventually wear the ring, right? Mm. That's what you're trying to follow in the crossovers of the of the imagery because that ring is representative of the ring lords and the table that they would sit around and so it's that king that is going to bring in you know the new age of peace and glory but is um, ring also then synonymous with the um the excalibur because there's no sword as such in lord of the rings no it's there is a ring can wield yes. a sword yeah yeah it would be it would be that kind of allegory, right? That that that's is what is sort of igniting that extra power. So it's that mm -hmm. same type of idea, just presented in 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 a, in a different format. But I also find interesting at the end of the Lord of the Rings is you have all of these creatures that were before the flood, all of these different types of beings. They are sailing away on a boat, mm. uh, on a river, or on a lake. Um, kind of like what we talked about in that funeral procession to Avalon or to the underworld, and that this is now going to be the age of man. And so that boat and that underworld and the water represent those beings going into the underworld and the flood being represented by the water. And now it's only going to be man for that age of man moving forward. And it's interesting the the scene where you know they drift off into uh, on this beautiful boat. It, it's there's a beautiful sunset. It's illuminated by light. It's like you're going to heaven or some paradise like place. But so yeah. doesn't it conjure up uh, a Im, uh, you know imagery of the underworld? You know going into the um, yeah. It seems like it sounds like you're going to a really nice place um, where yes. yeah. The very interesting thing or takeaway I have from Lord of the Rings is that is that the, uh, the ring obviously is, um, it pulls you in. So whoever is wearing it will eventually self, almost self-destruct from it because it, it's like it feeds uh, the inner desire to be more and more powerful, right? Yes. Because, yeah. And it's interesting that Gandalf, I think very cleverly uh, gave the task of 
getting rid of the <laughs> ring to a hobbit because hobbits seem very childlike innocent uh, you know beings who don't really have any interest uh, interest in uh, you know uh, having any kind of power or any kind of you know this worldly materialistic things they just like to go like work hard have fun party a little and just enjoy life so I thought it was interesting that he gave that job or task to uh, a hobbit and it kind of, kind of ties in with the bible as well that you know how it said that only the children can enter the kingdom of heaven yes yeah. So it's that innocence. Yes. I think he's not talking about children, children. He's talking about that inner child within us that is pure and innocent. That, that, that purity that isn't going to corrupt things and isn't yeah. going to use things um, for illegitimate reason. You need to be that sort of pure. Absolutely. I think there's a there's a relationship there. Yeah. So that, I thought that was a nice yeah. message in that story that if you can, yeah. you have eyes to see, you will see that, that, yeah, it's, uh, it had to be a hobbit, a, a childlike yeah. uh, being that who would be able to do it, even though it was hard for him, but he was the only one who could yeah. do it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it's very interesting about, yeah, I mean, Lord of the Rings is hiding so many interesting uh, truths about our past, really. Um, it's just a, a whole area of inquiry is so interesting. Um, okay, so let so coming back to legend of King Arthur, you know there is a legend that said not legend, uh, well there's a claim that was made by monks in uh, eleven ninety one or uh, somewhere in the twelfth century that they actually found uh, Guinevere, Queen Guinevere, and King Arthur's remains in a cemetery near Glastonbury Abbey, and um, the claim of the monks was that it had uh, when they dug them up, there was a little metal cross which had an inscription that said, uh, here lies the famous King Arthur and his Queen Guinevere. And uh, so they then took the remains from the cemetery and it, it was buried in the glass, inside the Glastonbury Abbey and they put up a sign. But then later on the story goes that the King Henry VIII actually got, um, yeah, he destroyed the, the remains of King Arthur. So I thought that was that was annoying of him, to say the least. How dare he get rid of such evidence? Yeah. And um, then, uh, so when I went to Glastonbury, uh, and I didn't know any about this, uh, that, that there was a site where their remains are meant to be, to have been found. But when you go inside the Glastonbury Abbey, there is um, this little plaque that, that says that this is where they were um, moved to after they were found in a cemetery nearby. So I, I I find that really fascinating. So what do you think of all of that? In terms of the the remains being destroyed or that's where yeah, both. they would have been like, buried? But, yeah. yeah, like were they really destroyed and yeah. Um, yeah, were they really found in the first place? Yeah. Well, Glastonbury has a lot of, you know, longstanding mythos as being a super holy place um in polytheism throughout celtic and druidic history mm. in a place of portals a place of power that emanates out of there um and you know there's there's a lot of reasons why there's so much activity there today you know when, when people are migrating there mm. so it w would make sense to me that they would you know bury him his remains there um but you would think they would have buried them in a way that would have been very, very much protected and would not be easily found, right, for grave robbers and, and things like that. I think, um, you know, if, if uh, Henry VIII was uh, eliminating it, it's because it's essentially a rival bloodline, because he's more from a European bloodline than the local uh, Celtic bloodlines that are that are highly represented in, um, in King Arthur and would have been re highly represented and was represented in the kingships of Scotland, which were obviously at odds with England at that time, right? Mm. Interesting, because, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know really what happened. And uh, if that was, if the monks really did uh, find, you know, the remains of Guinevere and King Arthur... It's, it's it really hard to know because, you know, the monks... They kept bones in almost every uh, monastery, and most of them were illegitimate, but they needed to create a sense of importance, right? So this is 
going to be a monastery that has the, the bones of this saint. Who knows where the bones came from, but typically it wouldn't have been the saint, so that they could create um, sponsorships from the wealthy and have a, you know, sort of a resonatra to, to, to continue to go on. If they didn't, they would be sort of lost into, you know, into, into history and, and, and not very much for attendance. So, mm. uh, but Glastonbury has a different sort of uh, mythos to it, where it is already this important place. So to me, if you're going to find, um, if you were to find legitimacy in terms of preserving those type of bones, that would be a place where you would expect it would be preserved. Yeah, and Glastonbury was very, very important to the Pendragon dynasties. You know, and that's the area where Joseph of Arimathea goes with, with uh, uh, Josephes, the uh, third son uh, in the polytheist version of uh, of the third son of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, right? Because they believe that Jesus didn't die from on the cross. And so that's where Josephes intersects with the Alain and the Camelot dynasties and the Pendragons and those bloodlines that I was talking about in terms of arrogance. So that would have such high profile within their belief system that it would make sense that they would take their important iconic kings and queens there to be buried. Yeah, because um, Glastonbury Abbey is actually built um, on the spot where they believe that when Joseph Arimathea came from, uh, you know, after Jesus passed away um, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea gave his tomb for um, his nephew Jesus, he, yeah, he, uh, he actually resided in that location and that's where they built the Glastonbury yeah. Abbey. So it's a, it's a place of real, you know, um, prominence. And I think, yeah, Glastonbury being there myself, I do find, I, uh, I did feel that it, would, it had a very special energy, like just the sense of it. Um, if you are sensitive to energies and all of that. And also the, the locals there tell you that there are a lot of ley lines that are actually crisscrossing in that area. Yes, that's so, the power that I was talking about. Yes. Yeah. And all of the major monasteries and religious places of the old um, Celtic religions and other polytheist religions were always centered on those intersecting of the ley lines. And a lot of the Gothic cathedrals and Roman Catholic cathedrals were built on top of those same sites. Yeah, and because of all those uh, lane lines uh, crisscrossing, it apparently creates a lot of uh, energy where uh, people who visit there uh, more often than not tend to have some sort of a spiritual experience or something interesting happened that they quite, quite cannot explain away through, you know, uh, logical thinking. <laughs> um, so, uh, I just wanted to also talk about the blood. Um, so when we're talking about bloodlines and the royal bloodlines, the, you know, the fairy bloodlines, dragon bloodlines and all of that. And uh, so these people just disappeared at some point in our history, right? So, but the bloodlines, do you think, have they uh, carried on, uh, not just from uh, with the, um, the secret societies and the royal bloodlines, but have they also, do you think, been passed on through your average person? Like you and me, we might have some DNA or something within us that is of fairy dragon or whatnot, you know, it's so many to choose from. <laughs> well, I think so, because you have people that are leaving the inner circles of the nobility all throughout the history, right? Um, either they're banished or they, they just don't want to want to be part of it so that blood's going to intermingle and the royal families also have to get new blood in all of the time otherwise you get things like Habsburg jaw disease or hemophiliac disease so you get these diseases so they need to be bringing in blood to, so that they can remain free of, of is diseases that they tend to get from intermarrying and they could still intermarry today so but they have to dilute those bloodlines over the generations so that in itself is suggesting that there's a intermixing of that bloodline so if if rh negative is part of the bloodlines of the demigods um and that uh, you have about 15% of the population of the world that has RH negative blood. And it's 15, dispersed. Five, zero? One, five. 
one five so, fifteen. Yeah. yeah, so it's more than like just the one percent or the five percent that are you know thought to be about the ruling class, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's dispersed more than what people would have thought in. I think that's the bloodline that's added, but not in the way that people will utilize that argument to say you can't add a negative because what RH negative means is it's missing a specific antigen. So how do you add something if you're missing something? That's that's because people don't look at it from the right perspective. It's not what's being passed on is the gene that produces the RH negative bloodline. And that's the gene of ISIS that they like to talk about. And so I don't, so, know, that, sorry, I don't know much about blood types and how, what yeah. it really, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about that? So this, um, so I can follow because yeah, so is RH negative uh, a blood type that's uh, connected with uh, royal bloodlines? It's, it's heavily concentrated into the royal bloodline. So mm -hmm. the Windsor family is, is typically O negative, which is the most, pursued after uh, of the blood types because it can mix with almost anything. And uh, so you have a high percentage of the bloodlines within the royal families. Um, and when you look at the genealogies that sort of go along with that, just to make some connections to what we're talking about, is that they track these genealogies. So that Prince Charles, who's obviously part of the Windsor family that comes from the original Habsburgs out of Germany, not the Habsburgs, the, um, oh, I can't remember, the Hanovers out of Germany. Um, he actually has through those, I think those bloodlines in through the Hanovers, he traces and is on record as saying he is uh, a, a descendant of Vlad the Impaler out of uh, Romania and Transylvania, who is a, was a red haired, hazel-eyed, pale-skinned, light-sensitive mystic of that the uh, character Dracula was based on, uh, and it was and he was educated in the uh, school of Vienna, school of Solomon in, in Vienna, and he takes his bloodlines back to the Scythians, back to the angel Tamiel, and so yeah, I think there's there's probably something to that in in, in any Rh negative bloodline, but it's the gene that you need to understand, and, and it doesn't always 100 uh, percent reproduce Rh negative in every individual of every generation, and you have to understand the genetics of that to have that sort of make sense. I have a, little, a document on this for for people if they want it, and so you have these these. Uh, Features that also come with the RH negative, and typically they're with pale skin people or people have pale skin with it, the hazel eyes or the blue eyes, the red hair or the blonde. They have higher encounters with aliens or occult experiences. They have all sorts of things that individuals who have that say that they have. And I won't go through the whole list, but um, I get people coming, you know, getting hold of me on, on email and that after a show or something and say, hey, I've got those traits. That's 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 amazing. And because uh, I you know I don't usually speak of it is what people will say. So I think there, there's something to that, that that might be part of that gene of ISIS, that spark of the divine that is dispersed throughout the world that they're trying to unite in that sort of new age harmonic conversion. So that's why I think they're so interested in genealogies. I think that's why they're interested in in genes and DNA. And I think that's why they're interested in, in blood types and they're sort of data banking all of that information for a utilization to identify who they want to be part of that new age moving forward. That it's very interesting you should say that because that's exactly uh, what I uh, what I've thought on this subject because in the past few years or even even longer there has been a real trend in people sending their saliva to get a DNA test to find out about you know how much percentage they're from this ethnicity and this and yeah. and um, uh, you know in Australia we don't have the labs but usually the the lab, uh, this uh, this saliva sample has to go to somewhere like America um, but you know the, you you pay for it. And there's been real sort of, um, uh, you know, 
interest in people because of that to find out, you know, and people do YouTube videos on that and finding out, oh, and then they, uh, you know, share their test results with all uh, their viewers. So I'm this, per <laughs> this percent, this and this. And I, I always felt uncomfortable with that because I'm like, oh, I don't want, um, why would I give my, willingly give my DNA sample to yeah. an entity that I don't really know who exactly. they're affiliated with, what they're doing with that. And even exactly. Like, even more recently, <laughs> the ads that I see on um, YouTube are, uh, keep coming up with, oh, you know, for Christmas, why don't you uh, uh, do an ancestry DNA test so that you can really, you know, learn about where you have come from and your, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> because like I said, you know, I don't know what they're, what they're really um, up to once you, like once they have your data, they have your data. You know, it's yeah. as simple as that. And uh, the other thing interesting is that, so in uh, the the Netflix series, The Crown, which is about, you know, I don't know if you've seen seen it, but it's about the royal family, uh, the Windsors, and I've only seen parts of it. I didn't follow it through all the seasons, but it is quite sort of engaging. But there's a very interesting scene um, when uh, Queen Elizabeth is about to be, uh, coronated because her father's passed away suddenly during a honeymoon and she has to come back and she her grandmother uh, he wants to speak with her and she the grandmother's bedridden so she goes to her palace wherever she lives and and the the grandmother is giving her this little sort of preparation talk you know just to get her to understand the responsibility that now lies on her shoulder and she said something very interesting she said um so your a role as a, and I'm paraphrasing big time here because I watched it a long time ago, but it stuck with me and it lines up with what you're saying. And the grandmother uh, said to her that you, you are born, uh, you know, to be a queen because something about that, you are a God. Yeah. And the way she said it, it was, it sounded like she was literally saying you, not others around you and yeah. your subjects, you specifically are a God. And, yeah. um, and in that Netflix series, uh, the reaction that Queen Elizabeth has to her grandmother saying that to her is sort of quite a little bit of like she's taken aback because she doesn't really know what to make of it. So it, it but I felt like in that uh, TV series from Netflix, they actually planted a little little seed of, you know, um, truth. Well, it, it goes it, it goes to that divine right to rule that yeah, King James that was famous for. And they believe in their bloodline that they were created to rule and they receive their divine right to rule as being a representative of the gods to rule over humankind mm -hmm. and they have the genealogies to sort of back up that legitimacy because they believe they're demigods yeah and i'm surprised they actually put it in such a mainstream show like netflix yeah. uh that they put that in there but it but i think it would you would you may not blink an eyelid if you um uh didn't know about all of these things you might just kind of think oh yeah i don't know you just move on but i think that was uh, definitely planted in there as a seed of uh, yeah. truth about the royal family well i was watching one series um on netflix that was on the Demici, and there's this one family that is rivaling with the Demici's and uh saying that you know they were born as a master race to rule and you are not because you are not of mm -hmm. our our race. I mean, they literally said that. <laughs> so they're literally putting it out there. Yeah. So it's it's, like, it's it's what they believe. Yeah. Mm. So I think this would be a good point to um, end this episode. Thank you so much, Gary. As always, there is there, I have uh, I can now, never run out of questions for you because I only have to ask a question and then you, you know off you go. They have so much uh, in depth knowledge it's just amazing and I'm really grateful that you've been um, a guest on my podcast so uh, before we end can you please let the viewers know um, the method of your research because, because I think it will really help anyone watching to uh, really get engaged with it all that you know how how do you go about do, uh, doing your research and I understand that you have a vast uh, collection a uh, library of resources that you openly share yeah. with anyone who want, wishes to contact you and learn more about the things that we've spoken about today yeah it's uh, if, if you're wanting some information on some of the topics that we're talking about today or what I might talk about in other shows get a hold of me name 
you know, at, give me the, an idea what the topic was, and because I won't remember what documents I offer on all the shows that I do. Um, and if I have a document on that, I'll, I will get back to you. If, if I don't, then uh, I can provide you at least some information on it and, and, and help you along with that. Uh, my method of research is, um, it is, it, it's, it's not really an, an organized kind of process. Um, so I would, I would explain that, you know, I have a fascination in a lot of topics, right? And one thing I can do is I can recognize patterns pretty, pretty well. And so I just sort of rummage through information and read and have access to stuff, but I'll remember things. And so I can connect dots. And so once I get on a thread on something, um, I'll develop that. Then I'll think, oh, well, there's another thread over here and I'll connect that and I'll connect that. And then I'll try and weave it into um, sort of the, uh, the topic that I'm trying to, to, to write about. And so when I wrote the Genesis 6 conspiracy, all I wanted to do was write a short book to see whether or not I could get published. Not this huge book that I, you know, I edited out 350 pages and the published version is over 800. So I wrote the first 10 chapters pretty quick because all I wanted to do was just kind of connect uh, the dots between the flood, the characters in the flood, like fallen angels and the giants and how that's sort of, um, connected to end time prophecy. And I just wanted to see whether I could get published or, and people would want to buy my book. But then my history is, is, you know, I love mythology. And I love history and I've read a lot on that. And I said, you know what? There's a lot of connections that most Christians don't understand that's written from a polytheist lens in all of these other cultures and religions around the world. So. I'm just going to do that. So then you do that, and then that leads you to the next thing. So it's like, well, okay, I can't just tell about the Greek mythology. I need to give a little bit more context because otherwise it would be meaningless. And then just like, now I got to get context for the religion. So I have to make those connections and talk about that. And then you get into the religions and you get into the mystery schools um, in terms of what was developing that knowledge cult around the world and then into the secret societies. And when you get into the secret societies, I mean, you're just always opening more doors based on the information that you have. And if you can't open a door, then I want to open it. So I'm going to research and find until I I can uh, go through the door. So in the book that I'm writing right now, the whole concept is it's, it's going to be a, a sequel to the Genesis 6 conspiracy, but it's all about connecting prehistory with prophecy in that sort of larger sort of manner, but mostly biblically based, because what I found is Christians want more information on prophecy, more information on pre prehistory, because they're not taught that. that. But as I'm going, I mean, the book gets bigger because I'm thinking, oh, they're going to want to know this and they're going to want to know that. And because as I'm writing, I'm getting these connections and I say, okay, I got to fit that in. I have to fit that in. So it comes from sort of this broad base, but it's able, it's what I'm able to do is as I'm working is say, well, this is relevant and this is relevant. Let's, let's work that in. Um, so it's interesting because, uh, again, I didn't think this is going to be quite as large a book as that I'm writing right now, but I'm already on chapter 45. So it's already getting up there in size. Wow. So, um, but yeah, it, it just, I, I just see the, I just see the, the patterns. Um, so, you know, I, I, I recently did a debate. I wish I didn't do, um, a few weeks ago because I didn't like the format and, and I was concerned it wouldn't be respectful and all of those things sort of came about but and i wrote in the book in in, in the genesis 6 conspiracy because people don't know you know the word where the word giant comes from right and you get people talking about sort of half the information on it which is usually part of disinformation and i like to to sort of crack down on that but so in the book, I make some quick references. I don't really cut, I don't cover off the etymology in giant in, in the first book. I do in the, in the second book. So it comes from basically gigantes and gyges. And one gyges is a king in uh, Lydia about 600 BC. And gigantes is a um, 
monster, giant monster created by Gaia and actually means earthborn and is, is the root word for gigantic and, and giant. But one of the gigantic names is Gyges, right? So pe people, when they're looking for the etymology of giant, they say, well, it means earthborn. Well, no, Gyges is actually the root word for gigantic because it was one of the gigantes. You just have this other king that's named Gyges down the road. And so in Gyges, it actually has a G and an E. And when you have an epsilon E, it, uh, the enunciation is a Y sound or Gaius, just as Gigantes would have had an E, not an A in the original with an epsilon, and it would have been the word, uh, it would have been Gigantes. So when you try to figure out how does giant come from gigantic, from a phonetic pers perspective, you need to understand it was Gigantes, so it was a shortened word of that, but the, the real word was Gaius. And it's, it, you have to follow all of that through and understand those, those connections. And that's the word that we get into English, you know, as, as, as giant. And the equivalent of that would be in, uh, as you get Nephilim and Raphaim being translated into English as it was understood in Hebrew as giant, right? And so you have to be able to connect those dots. Otherwise, you can't present a balanced sort of argument um and i just i for some reason i can make those connections that's and i, think and that's I, where and I follow it is. yeah and i yeah. think that's where the skill is because we can all read and you know research as much as uh, uh we can but you know it's ultimately being able to see those patterns and being able to connect those dots and i feel like you really go uh do uh, you do a very deep level research in, uh, in a very broad um based of subjects and like even within uh, you know religions you've uh you uh, researched, you know, of course, the Bible, but the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, Gilgamesh, and all the, you know, and then you've got the the legends and the mythology and whatnot, and those secret society publications. So there's such a broad base, and then for each of those, you really do a deep dive, and and then you're then you're looking for patterns and connecting dots. I th feel like it's a it's a vast undertaking, but you really, I can, you know, when I talk to you, that's why I can I can ask you a question and I can you will just you know <laughs> give me like you know so much information it's just amazing and I really uh, appreciate that and respect that but also um, please let the viewers know where they can find you and how they can follow your work and uh, also purchase your current book uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis 6 Conspiracy and uh, like you said you're in the um, uh, you're in the process of writing your next book and when do you think you might be publishing that one? Hoping to have the, the, the sequel out uh, next year, um, hoping to have it to the publisher within the next three months or so. So yeah, so that should be the next one. And I think for a Christian perspective, I mean, this is good from a Christian perspective too, the, the first book, but I go off into other areas connecting that information that I thought uh, Christians would need that comes from outside the Bible, but I measure everything against what the Bible says, so no worries there. Um, best way to get a hold of me, though, is through my website, which is genesis6conspiracy.com. That's genesis6, the number 6, conspiracy.com. And on the website, there's a contact the author. So if you want to get a hold of me, you just click on that. If you want to buy a copy of my book, you can um, buy a copy from me through my website, sign copy. I ship overseas at the same price I ship into the United States for. I live in Canada. Um, so you just go to the US page and get a signed copy, or you can connect over to Amazon.com, although I don't think they do a good job of distributing it over in, in Australia or New Zealand. It used to be, but it's very expensive over there uh, to get it through that sort of source. So it'd be less money to buy it through me. Barnesandnoble.com also it's available through, and you can get a digital version in um uh from amazon as well for in a kindle version so it's available on most online bookstores um so it's available there as well and i'll provide all the links below in the description bar as well for easy access yeah. so thank you so much gary for being my guest and i look forward to another future podcast like i said i always have so many questions for you so thank you for joining me today well thank you it's been it's been fun
So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Gary has so much knowledge in his area of research that I could talk to him all day and only scratch the surface of how much he actually knows. I have so much curiosity about the legends that have been buried in the mists of time. So it was fascinating to hear Gary talk about King Arthur and Guinevere, especially as being part of the fairy and dragon lineage. This is so interesting to me. There is so much mystery and magic hidden in these tales that it begs further exploration. So I hope to bring you more content related to the fairies and legends of prehistory. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please follow Gary's work at www.genesis6conspiracy.com. And please do check out his book also titled Genesis 6 Conspiracy. I'll provide all the links below in the description bar. So until next time, thanks for watching.